Uh, who knows? Uh, thank you, Martin, for the introduction. Uh, I thought that uh, some people don't need introduction because you all know them. I also don't need introduction because nobody knows me. So it's the same. Ten, ten years ago, um, uh, I was working for uh, the biggest uh, academy, software academy here, and I had my first uh, public speaking there in front of a classroom of 500 once again. And I was frightened. Uh, um, but I had the advantage that I know something, they know nothing. The problem is, uh, today I know more, but these guys uh, that were there 10 years ago are here, and they have 10 years of experience, so I'm more frightened right now. Uh, so, yeah, as Martin said, uh, my name is Ivan Yonkov, uh, and I'm the CEO of a software consultancy, Codexio, but it's not important here, I'm not going to do any of this marketing stuff about our company. Uh, uh, however, the more important thing is that I classify myself as a Java archaeologist, mm, which you might understand the mnemonic here, uh, but uh, I'm in a relatively young age, even though my uh, right here, maybe you don't see, but it gets wider. Uh, so, uh, but in this relatively young age, I think I've uh, already dicked uh, into some things that were mm, maybe long gone or long uh, died before, and I think this is uh, mm, some of these uh, things that made me better developer. So if there are some of these guys from the young generation of the software developers here, and uh, they think, ah, let's uh, do only Quarkus, Spring, or whatever it is, uh, please do all the legacy stuff, it will make better developers, then you need to retire at 30, but um, uh, who cares? <coughs> so welcome to the funeral of uh, Java Refraction. Uh, we don't. Uh, I if I could h play some music, I would make this funeral march, but I'm not gonna do it. It would be mm, very inappropriate, I believe. Uh, let's uh, let's not uh, do anything uh, against the these that are died. So uh, yeah, the reflection uh, is uh, that that's very controversial because uh, two years or three years ago I did a talk that how you can uh, achieve abstraction via reflection. So uh, sorry to anyone that uh, was invested too much into reflection uh, from this my talk, but I needed to have some uh, field to do another talk. So yeah, N now you are very invested into reflection and I need to make another thing. So you will be invested then in annotation processing and I will kill yourself again. Uh, so yeah, um, reflection is that. So let's price the annotation processing. I, let's uh, see what we're going to be talking about today. But before I present you the agenda, I would like you to go to this uh, URL. This is actually Slido, where you can ask questions. I very much appreciate questions. That's why, you know, um, very shortly, here will be elections in Bulgaria, and the party sometimes pay people. Oh, no, I, I didn't say that, but uh, no, I, I did the same. I paid these people on the first uh, line to ask questions that are appropriate to myself. But I give you the opportunity to ask questions, again, here. No moderation, so you can write any rubbish stuff there. Just I'm not going to present it there. I will check it on my phone. And so whatever you write, only you will see it, not on here on the screen. Uh, this QR code will stay there on the, uh, oops, on the bottom right corner, so you can scan it anytime. And I don't know if it's visible. I tested it in the morning from the half of the hole. It was scannable. Uh, it's the same as this URL there. It's shortened URL of the side. So any questions, anything, so please ask them here. Um, I may check them regularly. Or if I don't check them regularly, I will check them at the end of the talk. If, I, if you want to be uh, answered right now, please uh, raise your hand and say, hey, the question is there in Slido. Um, I'm going to check the questions. So yeah. Uh, Let's see what we're going to talk. Obviously, uh, we will talk about reflection a little bit. And obviously, we will talk about annotation processing. Ah, what a surprise, right? And also, we will talk about bytecode manipulation. Maybe the interesting stuff. But if you're not into any of these three topics, then it will be interesting for you. Or maybe you will not in uh, understand anything, which is also fine. Uh, so, uh, before going to reflection, I would like to say some things about a uh, clean code or let's say abstraction. So, let's imagine we have these uh, conditionals. Uh, we should not, of course. Mm, what is the problem here? Uh, let's imagine we have a system that has different ways to authenticate a user or another party. You can do it via credentials, you can do it uh, mm, with exchanging some tokens. You can do it via some certificate login. 
Uh, but also, if it's a credentials, it can be password or social media or some other thing. Uh, if <laughs> I clicked only once. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so if it's a token exchange, uh, maybe you should verify the issuer, or maybe you should not do it. Uh, if it's a certificate login, you may allow or disallow the safe signed certificate. So a lot of conditionals with another conditional inside of them. And pretty much if you've been into any legacy code or any code, you might see this. This is very common years ago, nowadays. Maybe it would be common uh, after a lot of years after now. Mm. I would like none of you to do it. <laughs> so I, what we can do here, well, this might seem not a big problem. The problem comes when you invest more into this matrix. For instance, uh, in one of the projects we are supporting, there is this kind of code, or let's say this kind of conditionals, but it's also channeled. So some of the partners may have enabled some kind of the logins and some kind of the steps that may happen inside of them. So let's say you have, well, we should verify the issuer, but only if the channel is X and Z. And, or we should uh, allow self-signed certificates only if the channel is Y and X. And this becomes more complex and more complex, and when you need to add new rules, you need to go into this code there and uh, to add new conditionals. And sometimes when you add new conditionals, they break the other, so you're in this vicious circle of uh, adding conditionals uh, and so on and so forth. Mm. Well, you might have read these articles or short book that's called, called uh, Replace the Conditionals with Polymorphism. So this is what you actually can do. Mm. You can have this abstraction called Authenticator, which authenticates receiving the request and the implementations of this abstraction will do whatever they want. However it's implemented, I'm not going to dig into the implementation detail, but you may have these uh, four inheritors uh, that inherit this authenticator. That's fine. That's fine. And then you may have these steps inside any of these authenticators. Well, a um, relatively simple implementation is to have a queue of steps, one after another executed. So you execute step, maybe it will go to the next step, or maybe it will fail, depending on uh, what happened. So uh, pretty much um, some kind of simpler and yet very robust software design. Then you have these all these steps. Fine. Uh, how do you uh, then configure your channels to use these kind of authenticators and these kind of steps? Well, you need some kind of mapping. It can be in your code or in an external configuration. Let's, let's think that maybe we may have this YAML configuration that says for the channel X, you have the allowed authentication types that are token and certificate. And for each of them, we have this series of steps. And if we were using some generic framework like uh, Spring or Quarkus or whatever it is, uh, mm, we may read these properties and we may, we may put some beans into that uh, so we can invoke them. That's fine, but some of these frameworks, especially Spring, uh, will do some magic, and this magic will be reflection. And uh, I'm not going to talk about any frameworks now. I may made some minutes of comparison, uh, but most of the talk from now on will be without any frameworks, without any build tools. You will use pure Java, and we will use a pure compiling of Java. No Maven, no Ant, no Gradle, nothing. So if we want to have in a pure Java application a reflection that scans this thingy and finds the authenticators from the previous slides and finds the steps and execute them, and instantiate them, and then execute them, you will have some code which will pretty much resemble something like that. You should scan a physical file location to load the classes, because they will not be preloaded in your class loader. Well, you need to find if there are class files, then you load them, then you see if some annotation is present there, for instance, if it's a step or not. Uh, then you take the first constructor and instantiate it. Well, this is very oversimplified, or I still clicked four times. Uh, it's very oversimplified. You lack any exception handling. You lack uh, any normalization of the full qualified uh, class name. Uh, also, you need to do that recursively <coughs> because 
obviously you don't have your classes in one folder, right? They're in packages, you go to another, you pop up, and so on. And also, constructor instantiation is very loose here. We take the first constructor that should be parameterless and did it. What if it's not parameterless? Then you need to scan for all the arguments and see if they're somewhere in the inversion of control container and especially impl implement Spring, for instance. <laughs> uh, however, doing this, uh, we will not do any much of a favor uh, for us. So, uh, well, it will do favor. Uh, the problem is that uh, mm, there is already tools for that, and another problem is that it might be slow. So let's have a little bit of benchmarking about that. Mm. Let's imagine we have a user, mm, which have a name and age, and we have 10,000 uh, names and ages. So we will compare now normal instantiation of user and instantiation via, via refraction. So here on the left side, you can see very normal Java code, where you uh, loop through all the 10,000 names and ages, you do a constructor instantiation of a user object, and yeah, you even don't put it anything, so anywhere. So maybe any other time that's consumed will be out of this one. And we will do some uh, timings. We will uh, print the uh, current time before uh, the for loop. We will print it afterwards, pretty normal stuff. And we will do the same. This is clicking. Okay, uh, okay. so we will do the same with reflection. And uh, this will be the normal case. If you scan the classes, you don't know their name. Uh, you don't have uh, the reference to the class object directly. So you get it by a magic string. Then you find the constructor by some arguments. Then you click new instance. Pretty much seems the same, honestly, on uh, on code on code level. But uh, when we uh, benchmark this, we can see that the normal aftermath takes like three nanoseconds or whatever is the measurement unit there, and the reflective aftermath takes around twenty. So seven, six to seven times more. You say eh, you run it once. No, you run it twice. And it's same, ten, th ten times. Third time. More than ten times. So you see, uh, uh, but you're using strings for reflection things uh, like bg dot uh, uh, something. Uh, if what if you have reference to the user class? Huh, let's check it. What if we have it, user dot class? Again, using reflection, but well, it's slightly better, but not that much. Again, six to seven times slower. So, from that part, we can say that reflection versus normal code will be six to seven or to ten times slower. So, reflection is very expensive operation. It uh, <coughs> it may uh, make our uh, developers' job easier at some point, but it's expensive on the performance side. So if you have some perf performance-wise operation, some application that should be performant, reflection is the least thing you want. You say, OK, I will not do that in the runtime. Sure you will. Some things should still happen. You say, OK, well, if we use some framework that uses uh, reflection, it will do it once, and then they will have editing in the RAM. Well, okay, if you have a prototype being in Spring, what you do? It will be instantiated every time, right? You need to click new instance. New instance. You don't have the normal constructor thingy there. So hmm? again, reflection on each interaction, each request for request called beans, right? <coughs> Speaking about Spring, <laughs> again, I click Spring. It's an empty Spring application without any controllers, anything. Um, half a second to build. Half a second in nowadays is too much. Uh, a request to the USA and back can take a hundred milliseconds, something like that. Not six six hundred. Ah. And the relatively normal Spring microservice with like five repositories and stuff. How many? Well, three seconds. And still a lot of magic that's gonna happen there. <coughs> yeah, I remember that I need to drink a lot of water. So, any questions so far? Let me check slide. Zero questions. You understand everything.
Congratulations. I need to speed up, I think. I have only 36 minutes and maybe one hour to finish. Mm. So uh, let's go to the essential part of this uh, talk, the uh, annotation processing. Uh, the annotation processing actually generates new code that will be there at the time of running your application. There will be no magic when you run the application. There will be magic before you run the application. In a normal compilation phase, let's say we have these three classes, course repository, Java course, and evaluator. In a normal scenario, you have the Java compiler, and the Java compiler invoked into this uh, folder of classes will produce, uh, this folder of Java files, will produce the corresponding .class files. Correct? You're already familiar with this concept. But we may have a annotation processor, which is a jar, another Java program that's already compiled and packaged into a jar file. There are some caveats here uh, up until Java 22. You can just have a class pot and it will involve the processors, but that's not matter how. So mm. you say to the Java compiler, I will compile these three classes, but I will supply you a processor, dash proc, this annotation processor. And what it will do is it will actually scan some metadata as far as possible during the compilation time and eventually generate new classes. It cannot interfere with the existing classes. It only generates new classes. So this builder annotation there, if it is scanned and there is some code there that generates new class, it will may generate a, let's say, Java course builder. Well, you might have used already some of these. I would not mention project Lombok here, which is actually 10% of annotation processor and 90% of other magic, but maybe Mapstruct. If you have used Mapstruct, it's a pure annotation processor which generates from your interfaces their corresponding implementations. So you have, let's say, user mapper, you receive a user mapper implementation dot class. So this is what actually an annotation processor do, generates new classes that you might use after, the, after you run your program. And that's a very powerful thing. There are a lot of use cases. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the use cases that I may rem remind myself now, but mappers are one of these. Other things that we've used extensively annotation processors is generating some common implementers. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say uh, in one application, we needed to have a lot of uh, services that connect to um, external services. They have very common code, but they have some clients that should be configured some way. And uh, maybe they should use some entities that are not there, so you cannot generify that. You should, uh, you should generate new services based on that. So we have like many service generated scanning annotation and a config file in the resources folder. When you run the application, you already have the services there. So there are a lot of use cases. I'm not going to go into this. I already said you may use it to generate builders. You can generate uh, mappers. You can generate any other utility classes based on your meta information that is available during the compilation. That is class information and resource files that you have into your project. OK, uh, how this is achieved? Uh, well, it's from Java 6. It's available. Some people may not know it, but it's a very old concept and still not widely used, hence my talk, because I would like people to use more of these things that should be hidden there. Uh, and uh, this is a very. It seems like a sim uh, simple API. It's not. I'm not going to lie you. And uh, David here will have a, a talk about annotation processing later today, where he will uh, deep dive more into this API. I will not do it, so I can spare some time here. He will do more on that stuff. Uh, but I can say that uh, you have a interface processor, which is implemented by the abstract processor. Uh, and it has an initial initialization method, uh, which is receiving one of these two environments, processing and rounding environment, uh, which we will later explore what they have, but I'm not going to go too much into that. The idea is that you need to implement this processor interface 
implement this uh, method that's called process, where you actually process the annotations and generate your new code. So if we uh, go into these two environments, what we will see in the abstract processor, uh, the abstract processor only takes, <laughs> only, uh, I may use this one, okay. <laughs> so uh, the abstract processor only sets the field of the processing environment and says we are already initialized, please go on, go to the process method. So these things like processing environment and routing environment, they have several methods. I'm not going to go through all of them, but let's say the processing environment, you can take the type you choose and introspect some types. Or from the rounding environment, for instance, uh, you can see, ah, when are the processing already over? Should I do some stuff after everything uh, is finished? What, fi what finished? means means that you generate annotations or you, you generate new classes over annotations, but they're already annotated. You need to have a second round and third round and fourth round. At some point, you need to finish. And that's essential for our logic. And let's say if we have the type you choose from the processing environment, uh, we can take the, well, similar to the um, reflection, but more limited and with other naming to be more confused for people, so uh, less people to use it, of course. Uh, the JDK team uh, made their best to make it uh, very inconvenient, uh, but, well, otherwise there would be no talks about it if it was very convenient, right? The same for the element you choose. You can say, uh, let's say all members of this interface or mm, some of this uh, stuff that uh, at compile time is uh, already present. Mm. You don't need to have to know the API by heart like any other API. You just need to know some essentials. So very, very simple annotation processor would look like this. Let's open a file writer. Let's write this Java code. Nothing more than write some Java code as a text. You say, really? Is it? Are we just? having some strings concatenated and then uh, print them, yes, that's it. But what you will write may depend on all the inspection and introspection that uh, you've done. And of course, you can have the strings in file templates or you can use some other libraries like Java Poet where you can have some domain specific language to generate classes. But as I said, no abstractions here, no like, third party libraries, pure Java, pure Java, pure Java, my friends. Well, uh, this does not do anything, so maybe you're not very interested into this example. Still, to illustrate what the annotation processor is, it's that. From the processing environment, you get the file and create a source file. Then you have a Java file. The Java file will be later compiled by the Java compiler. At the end, you have two, the Java and the class file. We'll see this later. But let's have a more complex example. Not the best for annotation processing. But if it was the best, it would be simple. We don't like simple things. We are developers, right? So but it's too simple, but not the simplest. So let's imagine we have the abstraction of cores, a uh, course like um, Java, for instance. It has a name and uh, some credits that you will receive as a student. So we will say, OK, let's have a Java course. Which is called Professional Java. And let's have a Python course, which is called Machine Learning with Python. So far, what's the, what's the problem here? No problem. But maybe it, you will need to instantiate one or the another depending on some condition. For instance, the name of the course or some other key. This uh, is called the factory method pattern. So we have this create method, which depending on what argument it received, it will return one of the available courses. If it receives Java, it will give you the Java course. It, if it receives Python, it will give you the Python course, create it, so new instance every time. Well, that's fine. But if we have a third course, for instance, say C Sharp course or JavaScript course or whatever it is, we need to create a new condition there. Well, this is exactly the same example I gave when I said we, you can do that with reflection some years ago. Uh, well, we can, but we can do it with annotation processing and uh, 
since uh, I already told you, it, may be, it will be faster because you have the exact same code already compiled. You will not have some magic which will be scanned every time in the runtime. So we want this generated. How? That's a good question if you already have it. So let's uh, create an annotation to comply the principle of the annotation processing. Factorized annotation, which has three thing, two things. A key, which is like the Java or Python naming, and how we will name our factory, the factory full qualified name. And to use it in the Java course, it will be like the key is Java, and the factory will be some bg dot something dot uh, course factory. And the same for the Python course, except the fact that the key will be Python. So they will share one and the same factory, but they will have different keys, the different naming the different keys in the switch case. How we can leverage this annotation? Well, that's a funny thing. Uh, we need to extend this abstract processor, we implement the processor interface, and have uh, some things initialized. We, can, we should say we will support some annotations. It's possible to support asterisk, everything, so all the classes will be given to you. That's another way of doing things. But let's say, more narrow scenario, where you will process only classes that are decorated with the factorized annotation. Then the other thing is what is the supported version. That's normal because mm, you cannot introspect some classes from other uh, versions. You cannot uh, create new sources from another Java version. So you should say, what's your support? Well, oh, always support the latest version. That's fine. And now we need to implement the process method. Well, uh, since there will be a lot of magic there for you, and if I try to explain it, 20 minutes will not be enough. So I will try to be very mm, not specific here. But uh, what we need to do is to store some uh, intermediate information, maybe in this map there, with uh, the help of some additional data structure. So if, they if the processing is not finished, we store there. So what we do in the process method, exactly that. If the processing is not finished, we need to do some things, like uh, get the annotation factorized, uh, check what are the key and what is the full qualified name, and do some stuff, like uh, create a new case, which will use the key from the factory annotation. It will use the full qualified name of the class, which will be mm, Java course with all the package. And then it will use the factory full qualified name to put it into the data structure, because we may have different factories, correct? And if the processing is over, so the data structure is already, the map uh, is already filled, we need to actually generate the source code. So we go from what we start in memory, and we generate classes. So what is generate class? It's another function that we write by ourselves using the same writer from the filer. We created the source file, we open the writer, and then we write some Java code which is public class some uh, factory, then public, what is the method name, like create, which will uh, return a course, and then switch with all the cases uh, from the case statements map. So let's explore our uh, structure mm, of the factory process. It does not need to be a new uh, project, but it's highly recommended. So if you are doing uh, annotation processing, extract the annotation processors outside your main project. And this is another project called Factory Processor. It has uh, several caveats there. You need this uh, file, which is uh, the, pr the interface that we're implementing. And in this file, we need to have the implementers, like our Factory Processor. Also. We don't use Maven, so we need to have some scripting to compile our, our code. We will just do Java C uh, through our source folder and take this meta inf services and put it into a jar file. That's it. So if we invoke this file, we will say, OK, in the bin folder, you have factory processor. And if you check it, you see that there is a factory processor there. That's fine. So uh, we need to kind of use this. So if we uh, go back to our code, we already know, you already see that uh, 
we have the factorized uh, annotation there, so we need to compile our code, but say, use this processor from uh, the previous compilation. So what we do is like we invoke the Java C, the Java compiler, and when we invoke the Java compiler, we say, okay, but you need to uh, have this uh, class path, noting to where the Java file is, and also this is our processor. So when we invoke this, what we receive is actually this cross factory here. And that's pretty good. This cross factory here, if we open the class file and it's decompiled by our decompiler, we will see this. Pretty amazing, yeah? If we have third or fourth or fifth class, it will be generated there. You click compile, you have all the switch cases there. You don't need to do it manually from now on. That's hard. Ah, magic. Let's see if there are any questions so far. No, you're pretty good listeners. Great. Uh, since we don't use any uh, build tool, if we open our ID, we still not recognize this class, so we need to add it to our uh, dependencies, mm, what we would be done before with Ma if we were using Maven. Ah, that's fine. But something is uh, still something that I don't like. Uh, and this is the fact that uh, even though um, it will be recognized at some point, it will not be something that when you type for first time, you have type hintings because you need to click the first compile to receive it, and then you have type hintings. And you would say, uh, what if I have uh, some uh, notation that says uh, uh, what is my factory, and the factory will have default implementation, which does nothing, and we manipulate it, right? So again, we have uh, two classes. They say, OK, use the factory and try to manipulate it. So let's go to again to the annotation processor. If we go to the annotation processor, we do another stuff here. We deduce the methods, and we try to add metadata against the current factory that has returned now. We want to add the cases, only the cases, nothing more, right? And uh, if we now invoke our Java C compiler, it will be very unsatisfied. It will say, attempt to recreate the file. Ah, you. It says, you cannot do that. Annotation processing, as I said before, you cannot manipulate the already created files. No way. And that's a limitation that we need to comply. Look again, there are a lot of uh, ways doing this. But, well, one approach which is not the best one, but let's explore it, is to create a new file. Similar to this, but let's erase the last three letters and use underscores. So you receive the original course factory, which does nothing, and another one, which is course fact, but with three underscores. Fine. And we have it, eh? you see. Um, on the left side is what you generated, but it has this weird name with the underscores. And um, the right side, okay. And on the left side, you, you can see what you originally created in your source code. Still did nothing. If there is any way we can reconcile this and receive this, there are some ways, and I will show you the most inconvenient one, the, the one that will m make your um, heads blow. So, I don't know if you ever inspected a dot class file, but it's not a random byte code. It's actually by specification, and it's listed there in the Oracle documentation. So you can see that a class file starts with four bytes, which are the magic string, cafe babe, yeah, mm -hmm. beer. We we're programmers, we're doing beer, but still, cafe babe. And then it's followed by two bytes, which are the minor version, the ma the, then the major version. And then, okay, what I did, and then you can see that there is this class there. So we need to go there and change it. This is co course fact. We need to make it course factory. So there is a way. Manipulate a class file that's already generated. So uh, what we need to do is discard the first four bytes, then discard the, uh, the two bytes, discard another two bytes, then check what is the size of the constant pool, then loop to it, uh, then discard the access flags, and then see what is in the class info. And the class info, they say it's another constant from the pool, so you get back to the constant pool and manipulate it, ah, right? How do we do that? Well, 
we need open a file input stream to already generate the class file. File operation, file freaking operation, right? We read a file byte by byte. Oh, we read, read all bytes, but we need to check it byte by byte. So we first discard four bytes, then two bytes, then two bytes. These u4, u2 are functions I will show you after that, but they essentially what they're doing is take bytes zero or bytes uh, two or and then advance the, the pointer of this index thingy. Then we check the constant count, and when we check the constant count, we then loop through it, and depending on which tuck it is, and the tucks are actually, so now I clicked, and it happens nothing. If I click second time, what will happen? Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> so all these constants, if it's a float, a long, if it's a UTF-8, if it is a class, a field reference, depending on what it is, they have the tuck. For instance, one is mm, UTF-8, so you need to take some strategy to read after that. If you read this, this, all the sections, you see what we do here, but we essentially skip all the constant pool. And when we skip all the constant pool, then we skip the access flux, then we have the class index. When we have the class index, what we should do? Well, uh, we have some helper functions here, helper classes even, the index class that keeps the last and the current, and we need to create a class name info. So what we are doing here is actually we need to change the name with this a, mm, well, I will show it on the next slide. Uh, but we need to change the name here, right? I don't have a, I have a pointer. No, maybe I have. Uh, it's not possible, no, doesn't matter. So what we need is to change this, first extract it, then change it. How do, how do we do that? Well, I will show you now these u for u two methods. But what they do is just reading some bytes and comply the NDNS of Java, right? If you read one zero zero zero, you need to first one to make it leftmost, so you need to shift it some positions, depending on if it's say two bits or two bytes or whatever it is. So, mm, yeah, u four for instance, four things you read, then twenty four times you shift it left, so it will be in the first position. Uh, and set we will actually just go to the byte array and set it. That's why we uh, made it the name cur course factory and then course fact three underscores. Because if the names doesn't match as a length, we couldn't do that. We will mess the whole class file. So we need to keep the same length. Then we can make it very easy. And uh, what we do now is say uh, actually this one. We take the original name, we take the new name, and then we use this set u1 to set byte by byte by byte the name of the new class. Actually, setting from class uh, course fact underscore underscore course factory. So the factory processor, uh, what it's going to do now is populate another thing, which is called meta, which will put some pairs. What class to what class should be renamed? and uh, write it in some file, like bin meta. Why do you write it in a file? Because then, when we go to the uh, packaging stuff, we will read this file and supply this to our new uh, method that is changing it. So we first make the annotation processing, it generates the weird names, then we invoke our byte code manipulator. So this package sh, now it's uh, changed. And what it is uh, doing here? Well, it is uh, click. Uh, yeah, fine. So it is invoking this bytecode name changer, reading the um, meta file, line by line, for each line. It takes the left and the right side and pass it as arguments from the main method. Mm, I will not go back, but. Uh, if you remember, the main method from the arcs array, it takes it 0 and 1 for the original and the, uh, and the ones that should be changed, and was doing the change. So we actually invoke this program. And what we receive at the end is this code, which is perfectly compilable from the first time because the course factory was already there. It was just returning no. But when you invoke the processor, it will generate the course fact underscore underscore, then 
you receive the uh, you, you invoke the bytecode name changer, which will change the course fact on this call, on this call, on this call. And then, uh -huh. again, seriously. So you run it, you receive professional Java, not no. If I have run it before without the annotation processing, I would have no, or no pointer exception, because the factory create would have returned now. But now it returns the Java course, which is called professional Java from before. So that's it. That's it. That's it, guys. Uh, we we've done it with a little bit of code ma byte code manipulation. Byte code manipulation is hard. It's very very hard. And there is another thing that we can use that is called compiler plugins. And compiler plugins, they can plug into the compiler. Ah, right, for compiler plugins. You can plug into the compiler and use the compiler API, which you cannot do in annotation processing. Honestly. Up until Java 9, you could, but they restricted the module, so you cannot. But in the Java plugins, you can. And for instance, in one of the things we are using in, well, in one of the projects, we just made some private methods public. Fine, in compile, public. But maybe next time, maybe next time. We don't have time for that, nine minutes only. So hey, that was it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, be there for questions. That's why I finished nine minutes before. So I would like you to stay there. And uh, if you are still following me, and if you don't ask any questions, I will then enable some polls. So I would like you to rate the presentation. And uh, while we are rating it in the same hyperlink, you can, eh, they made my presentation go back. So eh, I cannot show it. <laughs> uh, but I, I hope you scan it. Uh, and ask questions, please. Any questions? There is a lot of questions, please. There are, I don't see them. Ah, one new question. So next talk will be annotation processing is that one live compiler plugins. Exactly, exactly. This will be. So invest time into annotation processing, make all your code base with annotation processing, and I will break your dreams afterwards. So you have new work to do and say your bosses, I need more time uh, to do some stuff. So job security, correct? OK. Uh, well. Another question in the poll. Should it be the compiler plugins? Please, another, another poll. Yes or no? It's easy to, to check it. Still, yes, no, yes, no. Ah, some people want reflection, correct? Ah. More? This is not possible. Can you give it to them? Such a good for all Tuka. Ah, thank you. Okay. Ah, that's fine. Hey, thank you. Uh, pay, the paid audience, the paid audience. Uh, so, uh, but in order to process the annotations and generate new code, you kind of still use reflection. Uh, no. Uh, no, no. No, you don't need to use reflection. It's another API. The annotation processing is another API. You process them in compile time. You produce code that it's not reflection-wise. It's actual code, as you see. Switch, case, 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 case. It is the code that you produce. You produce it like a Java file, like a real file, and then you compile it. No. Yeah, the reflection class is not possible to be used. You have type you use, and you have the type element. The type element is the one that you can use. Yeah, you 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 can you don't you can you cannot pass a class of something that's not in your class uh, structure now. Uh, it's in your class, then you can, but it will be reflection. Yeah. <laughs> But don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. OK. 
Can you make a DI container with annotation processing? Yeah, that's uh, one great thing that you can create. You can scan the B annotations and stuff, and you can create the dependency injection container with a pre-populated hash map of objects and their de the dependency graph. So, uh, I think Quarkus are doing this, but not really sure. I haven't inspected the whole code base of Quarkus, but I think their dependency injection is in such a uh, in, in way. A compiler plugin, maybe a compiler plugin. Okay, so Niden says there is dependency injection for Android. So everything in Android that uses annotation, use code generation, that's that's a good thing. It looks really complex for such a simple example, yeah. And such a si simple example took 40 minutes. So if I had to uh, make an example with more complex to justify it, I would need the whole conference here, and I would really doubt you would stay. Yeah, question. Yeah, so, so, so the question was, uh, why haven't we used a, uh, an interface that's called course factory, then we implement it with course factory in IMPO, for instance. Well, that's fine, but you need to say somewhere in your code, new course factory IMPO, and you would not see this IMPO before compiling anything. That's why we used a class that's already there, and then did it. We can combine it with what you proposed and the dependency injection container. Then it's gonna work. Which uh, Java versions you can use in annotation processing? Well, I believe any, but for sure from 1.6 to 22. Not sure from below if it's possible, maybe not because it's not there, like an API, so probably not. Uh, what uh, Java functionality you really want to be deprecated? Well, uh, I don't have such things, maybe I would like to have deprecated all the Jacks B thingies, but mm, that's a personal opinion. More, I would like the generics to be real ones. This is not a deprecation, but it's a change that I would like. Uh, when a critical production issue occurs, what are the first steps you take to reach and mitigate the impact? How your team handled it from detection to the solution? Well, this is a good question, but not relevant to the topic, so I will leave it for last. Can you give us some useful Java plugins that can help us become better devs? Yeah, there is uh, some great ones, I think. I found it because Naiden told me when I was looking for something, so I will check the chat with him. <laughs> uh, manifold, yeah, Manifold. It was called Manifold, yeah. One thing I will do, sorry, Naiden, to, to interrupt you, but I will also change the l last poll to be what can be improved for the next presentation. You can do it offline. You can go to the coffee and still vote there. But um, what uh, what are the what can be improved? Should we have more examples, less examples, and stuff? There is a multiple choice thing. Yeah. Uh, so for the question about the production issue, I can um, it will be a long topic and a new uh, and a new topic. But I can say that annotation processing since it generates a real code that you can see in the debugger, will give you opportunity to debug it. And reflection and runtime proxies and all that stuff makes it completely unreadable and you're like, okay, so a new instance of something here and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe if you have debugged any code of the dispatcher logic of uh, Spring, you will be like, what's happening here? But if it was a real code that you can see and navigate through, it will be very easier for you to, to debug it. The class directly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not not really sure about it. Uh, if you can have only the class file uh, without the Java file, maybe you can compile it using the compiler and store the, the class file. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if there is a convenient API for that. True, 
Java annotation processing. And Wombok is not um, it's not a good example as they are annotation processors only to, to start, but then they override the whole compiler uh, thing is there and uh, make a lot of other magic, which is uh, which is not a real annotation processing. They only use the stage of annotation processing, but they then do a lot of uh, um, stuff there. Yeah. That, that's why I don't give them as an example because it will be um, not fair fair game. Okay, uh, only 50 seconds I have left. So, any other questions? Well, I'm still here. So, mm, if anyone wants to, to say something or mm, we can have a chat, I'm here. Otherwise, we can check on the coffee zone, beer, or something like that. So, thank you once again.